This is the AI Assisted Organization podcast by Implement AI with your co host, myself, Piers Linney, and my co host and also co founder of Implement AI, Alok Shokla. Good morning, Alok. Hey, good morning, Piers. How are you? So I have a, I've, I'm still on my uh, conversion van tour, like I always say, Amazon van on the outside, private jet on the inside, and I've made it to uh, Luxembourg, not a country I thought we'd be staying in. We got as far as Dubrovnik and decided that 40 degree temperature and forest fires weren't going to cut it for us. So we uh, we cut and run, and headed back through um, Austria and Germany. So I got to have a, a, a Bavarian breakfast yesterday, which took me all day to recover from. Um, but here we are, back in the UK. I'll be glad, glad to get back actually and actually get onto it rather than a, But I've got all the gear today. I've set up my digital camera, I've got my Zoom podcast kit. So hopefully it sounds better today than it did last week. So um, let's get into it. We've got quite a bit to go for actually, quite some interesting um, yeah. stuff. Um, so let's kick off. So one of the um, big pieces of news really is the, the US government has reached a, it's a, it's a voluntary uh, agreement with large tech companies. And it's all the tech companies you would imagine it would be. Your message, your Microsoft, your Anthropics, OpenAI's, Amazon, etc. And um, they've they've come in a slightly different uh, way as they did in the EU. So the EU are talking about you know regulation as well. And I'm sure the UK will kind of follow suit very closely. Maybe EU or between the two. But in the US have gone for kind of um, three principles really. So one is safety. So it's a bit like the EU. You know, how safe is it? Um, depending on the, the sort of existential risk caused by um, or the potential risk that that artificial intelligence could call uh, could cause the it may be regulated in different ways so safety is a really important one and they want the large tech company to share information on risk on development and on issues as well and importantly which is quite interesting they want to have independent experts test these models these these platforms yeah. before they're kind of let loose on the public and the second pillar was security as you can imagine so cyber uh, reporting vulnerabilities, again, independent testing. And the last one really was trust, which is public trust. This is a bit like the EU as well, where almost they want to have AI-generated content, almost sort of watermarks. So I'm not sure how exactly that's going to work because obviously bad actors don't care. They won't be, well, they won't be watermarking anything. But um, so you can see um, that they're, they're kind of got slightly different angles where they're coming at it, but they're probably all going to arrive in, in a similar place in terms of how you regulate and protect the public and uh, industry from the, the, the potential downsides or the complexities that AI can create. No, definitely. And touching on the watermarking part, I was listening to a podcast with Imad Mustag and like in stable diffusion, it's already been built in um, several different elements of watermark, basically. So that's in the foundational model. So anything created from there would be um, identifiable as such already. So they, they, I think all the systems really have these things at the foundations. The question is who can detect it or not. But what's quite interesting though is if you imagine that you know you want to create some imagery for you know instead of stock imagery um, for your website or whatever you want, we'll talk, we'll talk later about you know website building yeah. and creating images for that. Are you going to have everything you know watermark, you know created by AI, cre- you know, mid journey um, in the corner or Dali, whatever it might be? It seems to make sense to me. So I'm, I'm quite. I think the idea and the principles make sense, but the the execution is going to be interesting because. Nobody's going to have an enormous billboard of AI-generated imagery with a you know a big sort of um, mid-journey logo stuck in a corner, or whatever it might be, some watermark. So I can't quite picture yes. it yet. Yeah, so so with the mid-journey one, if you're using the, the, the subscription model, then you do have commercial license to use those. Um, watermark, I meant, I meant digital watermarking, basically, right? Like, uh, So it's the file is identifiable as such. Yeah. yeah, but if you're... So I get like an NFT, which is... Probably the only use case I think there is of NFTs right now, um, which is it's a watermark content. But visually, if I see a video of somebody or an image, how am I supposed to know if that is um, AI generated? That's the point I don't quite understand because yes. most advertising, for example, you're not going to have access to a digital watermark, are you? No, and and that's the way it's going to become increasingly difficult to understand the differences. But I think pretty soon it's going to be safe to assume most images are going to have some form of AI component to it, either in retouching, just like with Photoshop. Um, but the speed and the execution I've been able to see of like the the web designs or the different designs and what kind of lead into that, it, it's really quite profound. Like the, the, the creative range that it's now unlocked for product photography, for video, for images, um, really quite exciting. And like we always say, this is the worst AI is ever going to be. 
Uh, so let's move on. Exactly. Big one, because this does impact almost every business. And this is one more focus, I say, small businesses. Uh, and this is text to website, essentially. So you hear the phrase text to image, yeah. text to video. But now we're getting to the point where you can almost, and we're going to come back to a chat GPT and you feature later in terms of context. But if you provide enough context, you can almost create a website with a prompt, literally. And that's, that, that's text, that's imagery, product description, the whole lot. So some of the news, and I think, Alan, you've been looking at this as well, but um, Wix yeah. has sort of announced that it's going to be launching, you know, text to website. Now, obviously, the more context you provide, the more information, the more content, the more product information, the better it's going to be. There are a lot of these out there. Um, some are very basic. I've tried them. Um, I tend to try most of these things. So they're quite templated. They're just kind of using standard imagery, which you can replace, obviously, very sort of basic templates yep. and layouts. And the, you know, the text but, but is... the format the layout is, is but locked. But it's a start. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But if you're no, if you're a small business and you did a website, it's a start, isn't it? Um, so Wix is one of the biggies. Uh, you probably see this coming out from the the others. You know, the square pace of square space of the world, the more proprietary platforms. But I know you've been looking at this as well, haven't you, Ella? You've got like the olden ones, like the Wix or the Squarespace, or even part of what Shopify we were talking about last week with their Sidekick will be able to do those things. But I was watching um, some tutorials and some very interesting ones where. They were they were recreating a like an, an, a sports um, sneaker or a sports shoe website, and they were using Mid Journey to create first of all examples of the shoe and examples of the website layout, and you could have the prompts in of UI UX and different elements from that, and then from getting some different examples, they then upscaled a few of those and then put those into a very simple editing software. And then from within the editing software, a bit like UIZ or a few other ones like this, you can then just literally just type and change what text you want. And they use GPT to actually generate the, the product descriptions and the elements on the website and the call to action. So the thing is, um, with two tools such as like Midjourney and GPT or any of the other models, you can literally fine tune and customize any website, you know, and that's... That's insane because, like the, the the graphics and the um, and the appearance of it was very professional. So you can totally imagine that you know if you if you wanted to look, launch your own business doing websites, for example, and you you like put together four concepts for your client, you can do these things very quickly and very easily now. Well, also a lot of these companies we mentioned this last week as well is some of the the stock imagery companies. They're kind of partnering with OpenAI, which is quite interesting, yeah. to allow them to use their technology to create images and in return. The, uh, the people with the large language models get to train them on their stock imagery. So in some ways, these are sort of um, moves against an existential threat because if you think about it, and, you know, again, you fast forward, it's all about Horizons AI, about how far out you're thinking. In a couple of years, you know, chat GPT will probably be able to create your website. It can code. Uh, they've got the ability to create imagery. Yeah. OpenAI has, that they can build that in. Um, it can generate content, we know that. So, I mean, what more do you actually need? All you need really is a selection of layouts and templates, and then it will just populate it and publish it. Thank you very much. So, if you're any one of these website building companies, uh, this technology is a, a threat to your existence. Yeah, and, and if you're like an enterprise company, like, for example, like you look at Amazon, like when they, whenever they're trying to do a new product launch, they always create their... Um, press release first of all isn't it like they write their internal press release about the product to help describe it to internally to um different team members and they have to read that before they could even like execute or even go further down the project well with this now you could even create the website and the look and the feel of those products so internally in inside enterprise or corporates you can really get much further in your concept and your presentation to get much further to testing you know i think you really each each company should have a small team that's able to do this in-house because the possibilities that you can unlock for A-B testing, for new propositions, it's quite profound, really. You made a very good point there because I, I, I keep talking about this this battle for the middle ground where small companies can now go after some of the larger company customers and large companies now have the ability to go after the long tail, which is usually the domain of small businesses. But you're absolutely right. If, if you're an enterprise, this gives you the ability now. If, if you can separate out a team with the freedom to go and test this, these things or test this stuff, uh, a kind of a skunk works, which um, a lot of large yep, organizations exactly that. struggle to do. But you can iterate now and create 
all sorts of content and products and, and you know, just sort of mock-ups or yeah, um, sort of storyboards of whatever you want, really, um, and test it in turn and test it with customers, test it with focus groups because you've got the resource to do that. Exactly. So it's it going to be very interesting, isn't it, to seeing who wins what I call the battle for the middle ground. It, it's going to be just data, really, isn't it? I mean, the question is, like, the more you can present a proposition to a customer and get some feedback on that, either through you know, pay-per-click adverts, social media, um, or even like directly presenting you know, a new product brochure or a new website to different customers through your weekly email, the, the faster you're going to be able to learn. And the truth of the matter is, you still need to interact with customers. So the companies and the enterprises that, that develop their own, let's call it like an AI and creative suite or an AI innovation suite or whatever you want to call it, that's able to then apply that innovation across different departments for product for marketing for sales those guys are going to have much more data points to learn from and they're going to be able to like deliver much more innovative products much faster because they will know you know it'll be de-risked what people are interested in going ahead so i think one of the key takeaways here is like if you're an sme you need to be looking at this because you can then iterate and maybe launch different products or refine your products or add premium ones if you're an enterprise you have to go after this because you're you before were constrained in like how many things you could execute with or test and now you've got the ability to literally reclaim your agility so i i think it's a very exciting time now and it, it leads into training love it there's a book there enterprises reclaim your agility i can see it all but that is a, a very big point that um hopefully we'll be talking to some of our clients about so let's move on to the the battle of the llms the large language models so everyone's familiar with you know chat gpt you know google bard which is still not quite there in the, in the various tests that you see when it's up against chat gpt but one llm that seems to be gaining ground and traction often because of its large the ability sort of to is, is it seventy thousand tokens i'm ridiculous is the llama yeah. 2 uh so What's interesting is that Microsoft have now partnered with Meta, who developed um, Llama 2, um, to basically allow you to use this as an open source LLM, um, unless you've got is it 700 million monthly users or something ridiculous. And then you've got, you know, Claude, Claude as well, which I know you've been using Alloc as well. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? That everyone's focused yeah. on ChatGPT, this integration with Microsoft, OpenAI. Microsoft is all over the map, partnering with everybody to try and sell up the market. They're now partnering with Meta, which isn't quite isn't quite Google in the productivity space, uh, but they are they do compete in various places. So that's quite interesting. And then Claude Two as well. It's Claude Two, isn't it now? So what's your view yeah. on the large language models? I know what I use. I tend to use ChatGPT, and sometimes I want to put a lot a huge amount of context in there. Um, Claude? Yeah, so I mean, I'm increasingly using both like GPT and Claude. Like, um, so for example, with, with, with Claude, like, um, my, my dad wanted me to summarize some um, lectures of psychiatry. There was a whole weekend conference, basically. So I was just transcribing and, and entering them into Claude, which then can summarize and, and get the details from that very easily. And what I like very nicely is that we also like um, summarized all of our podcast episodes and extracted all the kind of key action points based on departments. So Claude is very good because of its massive context window. And what I like about Claude as well is they've got very good instructions on, um, you know, you know, prompt design, they call it, and, and the different elements to kind of like make it much better. GPT is obviously a very useful and strong power, power horse, but Microsoft, the key thing here for enterprise, like they had their... Um, they had a, a partner event, which was the, which was broadcast, and we were watching that, and that's very interesting because they've got the ability for enterprise to have their own closed, secure portals with literally they can choose what language model they want to use. You know, they can use Llama, they can use GPT, they can use any of the different other ones, and and, and from Anthropic and Claude too. So I think the key thing here is like you're going to use different ones, and it's going to be agent flows. It's going to be like this for this part, this for this part, and this one checking the other one, basically. I think that's where it gets interesting, where you've got different language models checking the output of other ones, but ones which have bigger context windows doing the pre-processing, for example. Um, so I, I think you're going to need different ones, but I mean, it's just it's just a very it's just a very exciting time. Yeah, that's quite an interesting um, session that Satya Nadella did with a, a lot of the Microsoft uh, global sort of partners. Um, I was actually the Microsoft Global Hosting Partner of the year 2010. So he had those kind of partners in the room. And essentially, he was explaining that the entire Microsoft platform is going to be built around this technology. It's going to pervade absolutely everything. Yeah. And they're going to make it as flexible as possible. And also, they're going to enable you to choose, like you just said, 
which language model to use, and also have all the same permissions you'd expect in an enterprise solution in terms of who can see what, who can access what, and who can change uh, what content. Exactly. But um, what about what about this announcement though? I mean, Llama two, you can go and play with it on Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a is a machine learning platform now. It's sort of uh, become a sort of an AI. Um, what do you call it? Hub for various platforms and models for you to go and play and yeah. test with them. But have you have you used Llama two? I haven't. I must admit, I haven't really played with it. I opened it. Um, I didn't. I haven't used it yet. Um, but I think it's just a very clever strategic move by Facebook because they're just trying to like essentially give power to more people to create their own, you know, medical fine tuned models and different elements like this. Really, so it's it's like the Android versus iOS play, isn't it? I guess really they're, they're trying to just um, have as much open source movement they're going. Yeah, we know, you never thought that Facebook, which is this sort of wall garden, literally, which is probably a smart move, um, given the fact that, you know, people are going bananas about um, these, these opening eye et al scraping their data like Twitter and Elon Musk. So they have this like wall garden. But now they're almost leading the charge. This is meta um, on open source models and frameworks. It's, um, it's fascinating. actually. I, I can't quite work out where they're going with it. Well, they, they released the PyTorch in the past, which was like an open source machine learning framework. And, and I think it's just a strategic move, really. Like they're just trying to like introduce more elements so that there's no one player that can win, really. Yeah, so so right now we're really using ChatGPT, the kind of the, the public model, the access via OpenAI via the API. And we're sort of using Claude, uh, Claude 2, which has this large context window, which basically means that your prompt can be almost as long as a Harry Potter book. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sort of uh, suggesting you do that, but it means that you can train it almost in a prompt on what you want, how you want it, um, and what format it needs to look like. So it's, it's very powerful. But just on Microsoft, move on to the next um, point, is that quite a big announcement. So one of the things Microsoft is working on uh, is Microsoft Copilot. So they've got one for GitHub. They're launching one, well, launch one for the OS, um, Mac, Windows 11. But the most important ones are Microsoft 365. So this is a, a Copilot built in. So imagine ChatGPT built into the entire Microsoft productivity stack. So if you're in, you know, um, PowerPoint, even Excel, actually, and Word especially, uh, or any of the publishing uh, packages, you will never have a blank page. There will be a prompt and the ability to help you generate content and, and fine tune it. Now, what everyone's been waiting for is how is this going to work? So if you're buying Microsoft Microsoft 365 standard packages, depending on what bolt-ons you've got, maybe for comms, you're probably in the, UK money, 15, 20 pound a month range per user. And the news seems to be that Microsoft wants to charge $30, right? So for to have Copilot. Now, in our view, if you understand this technology, understand its capability, what you can do with it and how it's going to empower, as, as we said in previous pods, scale up your human resource, that's cheap. But the issue is in a small business, you know, Couple of, if you've got five, ten of you, you know, a couple hundred quid a month can make a difference. If you're a large enterprise and you want everyone to have access to this, or more, almost the departments that need to have access to it, this can add up to quite a large monthly bill quite quickly. So the point really is, is, hey, I don't know what you think, Alec, about the cost of it, because I guarantee you, if, if I was a betting man, that Google Duet, when they come out, will, will be nowhere near $30 a month. So the point's going to be is, as you roll this out and start to absorb that expense, is are you going to get the return investment out of it? And that's going to come down to everyone who has access to that technology, understanding how to use it uh, exactly, understanding how to use it and being trained on it to make sure they extract the most value and you as an organisation have that return on investment. I completely agree. And I think that it's a very powerful and a very um, clever move by Microsoft to do this. And that the power that they're unlocking is insane. Like there's just so much potential and um, built into it but the thing is you're just not going to need as many people to do as many tasks because the ai is going to be able to do a lot of it so i think companies need to really, really like enterprise need to like strategically evaluate like what is their roadmap where are they going to go with things this is why you, you need to like have someone or a fractional chief ai officer which is like thinking about like where it's going to be where we're going to deploy ai which departments how is it going to be how we're we going to upskill those people what are we trying to do with ai you know 
you need to think about this very carefully because otherwise it's going to turn into a bit of a mess basically within companies where you'll have like you know shadow people you know shadow it and people doing work in, in short amounts of time than required and you, you lack of control you, you need to like have a, a policy strategy and framework now and uh, because all the all the tools all the power is being de- being just unlocked and it's it's quite profound and people aren't ready for the level of power that there is now and within six months it'll be even more powerful so i think that's the kind of key thing now to understand even if ai innovation stopped right now the power that's available right now is, is profoundly disruptive and over the next six months that's going to evolve so you really need to get your strategy and, and your policies in place really and, and training so you can start using and benefiting from this because you need to be using it. Yeah, and if you're a small business, you know, that that chow, the chief air officer, is going to be the founder, the owner, the, the MD. Um, and and you know, you're, they're, they're putting out fires. They're trying to keep a business going and keep the lights on. You know, we've, we've all been there. So trying to keep up with this is very, very difficult. Um, if you're an enterprise, then this becomes part of a fundamental policy development. Uh, and... What we see, we talk to a lot of, you know, CIOs, CISOs, whatever you want to call them, CTOs even, and it's not really their job. That They're kind of still um, busy on existing long-term projects, you know, transitioning to the cloud or some cybersecurity projects, whatever it might be, rolling some new um, system out or software across an organization. They're trying to get your head around this and keep up with it um, is very difficult. So having that sort of chief air officer, the, the chow, um, and we provide fractional ones in the organization is actually really, really quite important. And I think that as you start to see this technology begin to pervade organization, I mean, once Microsoft turn this on and you purchase it, literally, you know, the, the, the power sitting in front of your um, your human resource yeah. essentially is enormous. But if you don't know how to use it, it is A, you're wasting money, and B, it actually becomes probably quite annoying because using, for example, you know, chat GPT, yeah, if you know how to prompt, um, you can create fantastic content. If you don't, it's very generic, very boring, uh, and it's, it's, there's no competitive advantage. Right. So training and having a, a, a strategy are really, really important because this is coming and it's coming at you fast. It's no different than anything else. It's just having the skill. I mean, some people with a hammer and a chisel can create Mike, Michelangelo as David and other people can just literally just break a rock, isn't it, right? So it's all about skill. Yeah, I'm definitely the latter. <laughs> right, chat GPT, some big news. It's quite interesting because, again, this is showing how quickly things are developing and where it's going. And one of the annoying things with chat GPT was when it first came out, you know, the interface is great. It's a chatbot interface, great. You couldn't access the internet. They kind of fixed that. Then they kind of rolled it back because it was getting around um, paywalls. So that as as people are using it, they're learning very, very quickly what they need. And one of the most annoying things has been this lack of memory. So whenever you start out, I mean, you can always, you know, copy your previous prompts into a different document and paste it back into ChatGPT, but it wasn't the best user experience. So one of the big things is memory. So I can't remember who it was that said that ChatGPT is, is like an extremely powerful, it's like a genius with a very short-term memory. And they're kind of fixing that now. So... They've now rolled out. This is available now. If you go into settings and where you turn on um, things like um, access to all of the different, um, well, Bing, basically. And the, mine's gone blank now. I'll do that bit again. What are they called? No, like, like what's the app store called? Access to code plugins. Let me do that a bit again. Um, right. Where should I do it from? I'll do it from. Yeah, so I'll do, I'll do all chat GPT again. So, Chat GPT, some big news. They've launched custom instructions. So this is the ability where well, it has memory essentially. So one of the annoying things about Chat GPT was that you couldn't access the internet. Bing access to Bing could have changed that. It was kind of rolled back because it was getting around paywalls. And then you know it's plugins, so you can access things like, you know, there's about seven, even a thousand of them now. Different ways of accessing data or information, like Wolfram Alpha or booking a flight for Expedia. And they're learning very, very quickly of what people want and what's going to add value. And one of the big annoying things was memory. You always have to start a new chat and start all over again. Now, as we all know, as we always say, this is the worst AI is ever going to be. And they're now launching custom instructions, which means that you can, in the back end, create context and provide context, who you are, what you do, how you do it, how you like your output, how you like it formatted, what you want to say, tone of voice. It can be quite long, very detailed. So now, when you are um, prompting ChatGPT, 
the output you're going to get is going to take that background context into consideration. So it'd be very different if you're a small business, you know, you're, you're, I don't know, you're delivering flowers to somebody trying to deliver um, messaging to a heavily regulated at large enterprise. So one of the things that I haven't got quite my head around yet, which is quite frustrating still, is that, so I use ChatGPT in different contexts. Some is personal, some is implementing AI, some is maybe for doing, you know, I know, writing keynote speech, whatever it might be, researching. And the point there is, is, well, do I need four different accounts? So, and again, this will be solved. This will come. But right now, the main account you use, you can provide this background context. And this is something we've, we've been looking at in some of the um, applications, or let's call them co-pilots we develop for our clients, where we provide that context in the background, but also... Um, kind of four corners of a box it doesn't stray outside of it no i agree like um having the ability to like fine tune your own models having like clearer instructions coming back to you having like a more focused message and the tone that you want that's what everybody wants like you know a more customized approach and it's just this kind of like step forward towards more personal ais that already know all our preferences so it's really quite exciting that like to see the, the speed of this is evolving at you know it's really really moving very quickly and you know we were just talking about code interpreter a few weeks ago and now you've got like custom instructions so the, the power that's there is, is is quite profound and i think the key thing is like having a strategy and a structure to to implement this and what's going to be interesting isn't it is whether you know things like microsoft copilot or you know google duet whether they enable you then to do this across an entire organization so that no matter how no matter what you type into that that prompt uh, window is that the output you get back is in line with your corporate identity or tone of voice whatever it might be and that's where this is going to go in in larger enterprises where you'll be able to basically build it. and what again is it's going to be interesting is that chat gpt features are not the same if you've got an enterprise deployment of um say open ai and azure they're quite different. The plugins are very different. The plugins on the enterprise version are more like cybersecurity, not can I book a flight and Expedia. But this kind of capability is actually really important across any organization of any size. And also just from a productivity point of view and efficiency, you're not just constantly pasting in um, the same context. So this is actually a really important development. And I've seen some people looking on Twitter where They've written really long, detailed prompts where it's saving a file, writing code, rereading the file, and they're almost recreating that kind of auto GPT mini, they call it baby AGI experience within chat GPT already. No, and, and I think that's, that's the key. It's like fine tuning it to the way that you want it to be. And ultimately it's like, you know, everybody having access to one of these LLMs is like having a really smart assistant, right? And then now the question is like, if your assistant's been with you for like a month, you've trained them, you've conditioned them, they, they know what you want. So in this way, it's just allowing you to kind of like do that, but digitally essentially, so you can like fine tune to your preferences. I think it's very exciting. So if you're using ChatGPT Plus, make sure you go into settings, you turn on custom instructions. In fact, make sure you turn it all on. If you haven't used Code Interpreter yet, go and have a play with that, upload some uh, a CSV file and just see what it can do. But in this case, turn on custom instructions and spend some time thinking about what background context you're going to provide to ChatGPT and then just test it and see what works best by changing that background prompt, that background context um, and see what the output looks like and then go with what really works for you and your organization. Well, let's move on. Apple GPT. Um, so Siri and let's face it, Alexa still suck. <laughs> so, and we all know that they, they've got this amazing not access to these, not for long, exactly. They've got this amazing access to these voice um, based platforms, you know, Siri, Alexa, and Google got one as well. And it can't be long before these things, you know, start responding to you like an LLM. So Apple thought I've been beaving away and they've made some kind of announcement sort of half-baked about sort of, well, it's not, it's not going to be called Apple GPT, probably not going to be called iGPT either. But they are now starting to make some noise about that they are working on this and the, the noise is coming out of that. And you can imagine that, you know, Siri, based on LLM, given just purely the fact of its distribution of where it is, it, it would be very, very interesting. Yeah. So right now, you know, I've been playing with Pi, you've got to download an app and... You know, it's, it's this different experience. Whereas 
with Siri, if you can just talk to your phone and it can respond to you as the chat GPT would do, that's pretty powerful out of the box. Yeah, and then if it can access apps, it can execute from that. I mean, you basically got your actual personal assistant that's going to be unlocked. No, you're absolutely right. You've got a a platform. You've got that co-pilot, that personal assistant, whatever you want to call it, sitting in your phone, knowing what's in your phone, which might always be a good thing, <laughs> knowing what's in your phone and what you do and how you do it uh, and what your objectives are. It's going to help you sort of um, deliver upon those. So Apple getting into this game is really important. The other one that's quiet, which is Amazon. So Amazon, you know, they've launched bedrock they make these announcements but there's not much sort of traction yet but amazon want to create um be the kind of a almost the app store for large language models as well but also we know that the, imagine the alexa platform with technology embedded in again out of the box just a distribution you know the physical product is built into tvs fire sticks just a distribution that apple and uh, amazon have got uh, is going to be a, a killer app no, it's just going to be massively fragmented again, basically. But yeah, you just can't count these companies out. So other AI news really is, we're going to focus on a bit of our news really uh, to wrap this up. So we've been sort of, you know, we've, we've been going at this now for several months. We've been engaging with clients, working with them. We've done several events uh, in, in well, I've done some in Lisbon. We've done several in the UK. We're doing more. They're being organized. And what we're finding out really is, is what people want. And yep. that's small organizations. But also um, quite large organizations as well, you know, a couple of 500 to a couple of thousand employees we're sort of talking to. So we've kind of developed the kind of the AI boardroom briefing, which is sort of a, a one and a half hour kind of a conversation to level up your C-suite. Tends to be sort of larger companies, but some small businesses have gone with that as well. That levels everyone up, so you're all on the same page, talking about the same thing. And then we've kind of developed um, what we call AI Activate, which is sort of a 60-day sprint, something where we work on one particular workflow to try and develop that and show the power of this technology. And then you can take it from there in terms of where you want to go with it. And for larger companies that want to invest in more of a longer-term project, 6 to 12 months, it's AI Accelerate and then AI Advantage. So Accelerate is more working on more workflows, trying to optimize your business, looking at what your optimized P&L would look like. AI Advantage is more, let's do all of that and accelerate, but also let's try and develop something which creates a long term sustainable competitive advantage what we call an unfair advantage using this technology because you might think everyone's going at this but like any technology they're not um if you can get ahead of the game in an exponential world no one's ever going to catch you up no and i think the key thing is is like if you're an sme you know you want to get you want to get get started and get it get engaged with us and if you're an enterprise then you know start thinking about getting some strategy in place and again like that's where we can like help you with like a fractional chief air officer service and, and different elements from there and i think and the big news from us really is is that um we're now developing digital training and a digital product so implement ai digital so this is going to be for people you know you maybe haven't got the budget or the time quite yet to invest in you know ai activate to AI advantage and this is basically giving you access to ongoing support and importantly training we think yeah. training is going to be actually really important. This technology is going to be very, very quickly. And whatever you train somebody on today, whatever uh, co-pilot you develop and roll out today, within a couple of months, you don't have to change it, iterate it all the time. But within a couple of months, six months, you're going to want to update it or change it. Or in terms of uh, people, your human resource is retrain or at least update the training. So we're launching a digital product, which should be accessed um, digitally clearly, access to information, training, um, everything we do really but in a more sort of bite-sized consumable way and also to some extent depending on what package you're on access to us as well uh, and then training and training is going to be designed for small organizations all the way up to very large organizations about how do you extract the most value how do you extract the highest roi from this technology whether you've implemented yourself or whether you bought it for someone like microsoft that's it right it's just having a clear roadmap and it's just understanding you know what part of your cost structure are going to change which suppliers may not you may you not need anymore because you can bring it in house with AI. You know what unfair advantage, what new proposition can you create for your customers? How can you reduce the cost support? There's just so many opportunities, and the key thing is just like you know work in a structured way to get those things done. But yeah, really exciting, and I'm really looking forward to the digital track, and um, that will be a great way to take people through all of the key impact areas in their business from marketing, sales, you know, fulfillment, delivery and operations and the, the wins that they can get through that. So really excited to work with more business owners about that. And also what we, we, we want this to be, everything we do to be as accessible to as 
as many organizations as possible. So that, again, just, just widens our, our reach and the ability for organizations to understand and adopt this technology. Well, we'll leave it there, Alok. So I'm going to be back in the UK next week, which would be quite nice. Um, and it's been a fascinating week. Um, there's a lot there for you to um, absorb if you're listening to this or watching this. So we're worth going through it again and making some notes if you haven't already. We spoke to a couple of people who actually listen or watch this podcast and they take notes every week, which is um, fascinating, which is good. I advise you do that. But you could actually clearly just use one of the, the plugins in ChatGPT to summarize the entire video for you from YouTube, clearly. That's just a top tip for you. But let's leave it there. So I'm going to be back in the UK next week, which will be quite nice. I've been moving around. I've done, we've done nine countries in two weeks, which is a bit bonkers. Um, so I'm looking forward to be back. And where are you going to be, Alok? Um, I'm back in Lisbon. I'm very happy to be so with my base and everything like that. So yeah, just um, two things from me. One, um, we really appreciate it if you get a chance to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, always appreciate it. I always like to learn what insights and what you found the most useful. And two, um, if you want to get access to insider information, um, we have an AI Insider newsletter. You can subscribe at implementai.io. Um, so yeah, just um, keep in touch and we look forward to hearing from you. And also, if you sign up to the newsletter, you'd also get, you'll get first dibs or first notice of our Implement AI digital track as well. So look out for that. Right, so we'll leave it there. This is the AI Assisted Organization podcast with Implement AI with your co-hosts Piers Lee and Alok Shukla. We'll see you next week. See you.